series on mechanical measurements. The topics I am going to cover today, error estimation and uh, this will be basically discussion on statistical principles and uh, broadly speaking they will be given without proof, but I will give some physical explanation of the for the plausibility of the proof of the, ex the results which I am going to give without proof. The subsequent topic which I am going to look at in more detail is a question of propagation of errors and in both the cases I am going to give some examples, one, one example in each to bring out the meaning of what I am going to talk about. And if time permits, I will introduce regression analysis as a last topic. I am not so sure that there will be enough time, but if some time is there we will do that one. So, the question which I am going to look at is the <coughs> going to appear in the following fashion. Suppose I am doing a certain experiment, I have set up the experiment and I am going to repeat the experiment. Physically, it is not possible to do the experiment a large number of times and therefore, I will be collecting a certain set of data. That means, I will repeat the experiment maybe a couple of times, a few times and I am going to collect replicate data from these measurements. Suppose, I repeat the measurements n times. That means, that I am going to set up the experiment at a particular configuration and in that particular configuration, I am going to not change the variables. I am going to make the measurements repeatably. The idea of repeatable measurement is to get at the statistics of what is going to happen to the errors which are associated with the measurement. So, what I can do or what one can do is to do this replication of data n times n data collection at a time and we will call it a set and then I will do the experiment again, again repeat the experiment n time and get a set which I will call as set number 2. So, in principle, I can collect a large number of sets, maybe m sets. So, the question now is the first set, the second set and so on up to the last set I have collected. Each by itself contains a certain number of data n. So, each set of data has got its own mean. So, let us just look at what we have. Each one of them, that means I am talking about the set here, each one of the set has got a mean and a variance. Variance represents the position of that particular set. So, the question is, is there a relationship between the mean and the standard deviation of the means? That means, I am measuring by collecting data in the form of sets, each having n data points in, each, in the set. I am measuring again and again. So, if I measure m such sets, I will get m means, there will be m means and each one of them will have its own precision or variance, therefore m variances I am going to have, all right. I have got a several means and several variances. So, what I will do is I will just indicate how it is going to be done on the tablet. So, what we have is repeated 
data n in each set and we have m sets i am using capital m for the number of sets so each set will have its mean and its variance we will refer to each one of the sets also as a sample this is a sample so i have a m samples capital m of number of samples of replicated data a replicate data a repeated data each with its own mean and its own variance that means that sample has got a mean well, we can indicate by m subscript say yes as the sample mean or the variance as sigma square for the sample so ms and sigma is squared now suppose the data collection involve let us say capital n measurements this n is the total number normally or usually greater than n suppose the data collection involved capital n number of measurements which is very large compared to n of course i have not done this i'm going to assume that i am able to do it or uh, repeat the data a capital n number of times which is a very large number then what i will get is shown in the next uh, slide so here i have total number of measurements capital n i will refer to this as the population the terminology is all borrowed from statistical analysis and uh, when we talk about the sample which is got its own mean and variance and when when we refer to the population here the samples were just a few of the data which are contained within n so samples are expected to samples are drawn from the population n so i can uh, assume that the population itself has got a mean so the mean of the population i will give the symbol m this is the mean of the population the symbol m represents the mean of the population and let me assume that the population also has got a variance which i will call as a sigma squared if i don't use any subscript it means that it represents the population so the question we are going to ask is what is the relationship between so we have sigma s squared and ms we have m and sigma squared what is the link between these two that's the question i'm going to ask so the thing i'm trying to describe is what is called sampling theory 
I am not going to give any proof for any of the things I am going to describe today because that is going to take too much time and in this course we do not just have time to describe in great detail. But nevertheless, we are interested in the outcome of sampling theory because it is going to be a very important uh, input when it comes to estimation of errors which we are going to be constantly doing in our measurement process. Whatever I have described in words now, I can also describe in the form of a graph. So, let me just draw a graph here. This is the axis of the quantity we are measuring. Let me just call it as x. And I am going to measure it again and again. Suppose I made, as I said, a sample, let us say n is equal to 5. I make the measurement 5 times and I get a sample and I can characterize this sample by its own mean and its variance. So, let us say this is the mean of the sample, mean 1, and if I were to indicate the variation of that, I will probably get something like this. This is the distribution which has got a variance given by sigma 1 square. Okay? I will repeat it and uh, next time I do again another experiment where I am going to measure it an equal number of times and I will get a separate different mean and it will have its own sigma 2 square. So, this is the So, m 1, m 2 are two samples and each one has got sigma 1 squared variance for the sample number 1, sigma 2 squared is sample for the variance for the sample number 2. So, I can do it any number of times. For example, I can show one more or generally I can show this is m i and it, it has got sigma i squared. So, the question I am asking is, suppose the sample, the mean of the population is mean is m, this is for the population because I have already introduced the notation earlier and it has got its own distribution, this is sigma squared. So, I want to know what is the link between this and these quantities and I want to see what is the link between these quantities? That is m1, m2, mi, etcetera. I am going to find out what is the relationship between them and the mean of the population. And I am going to also look at the variance of the entire population and the variances of each one of the samples. Why are we concerned with this? Imagine you are conducting an experiment and maybe I am going to just do once. I am going to just collect one sample. Let us say this is sample, M2 is the only one sample I am going to collect and it will have its own mean and it will give a variance. Now, what I want to get at is the value indicated here and I want to find out what is the precision if I were to repeat the measurement again and again a large number of times. So, it is a very important question from measurement theory and practice and therefore, we are concerned with this question of linkage between these two. So, what I am going to do is to look at this question and that is done in the subsequent slide. So, I am just repeating whatever I have said earlier. So, we have a n the total number of data in the entire population and the mean of all the sets we can show which I call as uh, m without any subscript will be nothing but the population mean which I used as the capital M earlier. That is the mean of all the collected data taken as a whole will be actually equal to the population mean. So, that is number one observation. The second observation is if you look at the variance of the population, I can define it in this particular fashion using the definition which we have given earlier in our earlier lecture. 
sigma squared for the population is equal to sigma i equal to 1 to the capital N, where n is the total number of x i minus m whole squared divided by n, this is the definition. Now, let us look at the population values. So, let the variance of the means be given by sigma m squared, this is the variance of the means, the means are distributed in their own way m 1, m 2 etcetera, these have their own mean and their own variance. Regarding the mean I have already described in the earlier slide that it is the mean of those means must be equal to the population mean. Oh, now, let us look at the variance of these means. So, if I indicate by the symbol sigma m squared, we can show again this is without proof I am giving that sigma m squared the variance of the means is given by a formula n capital N minus n divided by small n into n minus 1 sigma squared. That means that the variance of the means is related to the population variance. So, sigma m squared is related to sigma squared through a factor. If I look at this factor, you see that it contains n minus n in the numerator. In the denominator, I have got two factors n the lower case n which is the number of experiments performed in each sample and n minus 1 where n is the number of uh, total number of experiments. So, now what I am going to do is I am going to look at what is going to happen in actual practice that is shown in the next slide. So, if uh, n is very small compared to n that means that I am doing the experiment only a certain small number of times which is uh, lower case n that means I am going to take only one sample. Okay n equal to i equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera I was talking about. I talked about several samples. I am taking only one of those samples because that is the only one which is available in our measurement. We have made only one measurement containing a sample let us say small n number times of, uh, of times measured. So, I have one set with a n data available in that set and this is much smaller than the total n which should have been done if I wanted to understand totally what was happening to the errors. So, the error the above relation which is given in the previous slide can be which is given here n minus n. So, I am going to take n outside. So, it becomes 1 minus n divided by n the ratio of number of data in a sample divided by the number total number divided by actually this total number is nothing but the number of m such samples multiplied by n that will be the number. So, in the denominator I have got n, this n I will take out, it will give you 1 minus 1 over n and those two n's have cancelled and therefore, I got this. Now, if I assume that n is very small compared to n, that is the assumption we have made, which is what is possible for, for practically, you see that this factor is very small compared to 1, this factor is also com small compared to 1, therefore, these two can be neglected and therefore, I can see that approximately sigma m squared this is the variance of the sample I have collected is equal to sigma squared the variance of the population divided by n. This is a very important formula because knowing the variance of the sample we have collected, we can say something about if we had or had we in uh, the repeated the measurements a very, very large number of times, what would have been the results. So, you see that the 1 over n is coming into play. Sigma squared by n is sigma m squared or if you want to find out what is the variance of the population sigma squared equal to n times sigma m squared. So, you have to multiply sigma m squared by a factor of n to get the variance of the sample. So, with this background let us look at the next question which I am going to ask. So, the next question is about the sample and its own variance that uh, sigma m squared which I showed in the last slide. So, if you go back to the slide you will see sigma m squared is the variance for that particular sample. I am going to slightly change the symbol and I will call the sample variance from its own mean m s is the sample mean I will call it as sigma epsilon sigma e squared. This e is symbol is used as an estimator. I am going to use the sample variance as an estimator or estimate for the mean of the population. So, the question is how is it related 
to the popular variance, population variance. That means sample and its variance. We have one sample containing some number of uh, measured values and its own variance I have calculated. I want to find out how this is related. That means that how sigma e square is related to the population variance. Actually, again without proof, I am going to show the ex expression. Sigma e squared, the value which I calculated from the sample, one sample and the variance of that sample is given by capital N into n minus 1, divided by lower case into n minus 1 sigma squared. Again, if I take this n outside, this becomes 1 minus 1 over n, and you see that the small n being very small compared to capital N, I can neglect that term and therefore I can write this as sigma squared into 1 minus 1 over n. So, sigma squared into 1 minus 1 over n equal to sigma epsilon e squared or you can see also that sigma squared equal to sigma e squared into 1 minus 1 over n. It is a factor which is coming. If I had not taken into account the fact that it is a sample variance is different from the population variance. I would have been ignoring this 1 over n quantity. This 1 over n is the quantity which is going to be extra. So, do, go, going back to that expression which we gave here, sigma e squared equal to sigma squared into 1 minus 1 over n, I am uh, recapitulating the definition. The last expression may be written in a different form, more explicit form. I just want to make sure that we understand what we are doing. I have got a certain of number of measurement x i, i equal to 1 to small number of small n. I am going to take into take calculate the variance. I am translating this expression here sigma e squared equal to sigma squared into 1 minus 1 over n to this definition here. So, sigma e squared is equal to sigma 1 to n because that 1 minus 1 over n is coming. 1 minus 1 over n, n is nothing but n minus 1 divided by n and that n will cancel off with the number of uh, summations in the numerator and therefore, n minus 1 is what I am going to get here. That n will cancel off, there will be one factor n in the numerator and the denominator which came from there. Therefore, essentially what I have is the variance which estimates the error in a single sample is given by sigma 1 into 1 to n x i minus m s the sample mean whole square divided by n minus 1. If you recollect previously we had n here in the denominator, but now I got n minus 1. So, the question is of course, we have uh, without proof we have derived this relationship based on sampling theory. So, I would like to just make it physically uh, plausible and therefore, what I am going to do is I am going to look at the I am going to look at you know make a simple note on the board so that we can understand or make a give a physical explanation for the thing. So let us look look at the physical explanation. So to recapitulate, we have x i i equal to one to n and the mean m s actually sigma x i 1 to n divided by n. There is no confusion here, but however, when I want to calculate the sigma e squared, I am going to write it as divided by n minus 1. So, the physical argument is like this. So, in, calcul in calculating the mean, in calculating the mean or estimating the best value, this is also the best value if you remember we have already proved this earlier. So, the best value is nothing but m s equal to sigma i equal to 1 to n x i by m x i by n what is this best value? This best value is based on the measurements available here x i i equal to 1 to n and when I am calculating this, when I am calculating this, 
I am using M S, which is calculated using this formula here. So, in calculating this M S, I have used one information or one unit of information based on data. So, I have already used one information based on data in the form of M S. Therefore, when I am evaluating sigma e squared, I have only n minus 1 information with me. So, we call this n is the degree of freedom to start with or we will call this also as DOF degree of freedom because we will be using this terminology again and again. And now, you can say that this is the degree of freedom available to me. In other words, the error estimator has to take into account that one piece of information has already been derived based on the sample and therefore, to that extent the sample is already used and therefore, the number of degrees of freedom which was n that means that n samples were available n data were available it is as though n minus 1 data is only available now to me because one information has been obtained using that data and uh, we can in fact generalize this we can in fact generalize this to a case where let us say I am measuring data which is in the form of a relationship between two different quantities. Suppose, I have a derived quantity y, this is the derived quantity, x is the primary quantity, this is the, the idea is now to generalize what we have said that till now to measurement of two quantities which are related to each other. So, when I measure x, I can find out y and uh, this can be symbolically written as y equal to y of x and I will write a set of parameters. Let us say a 1, a 2. So, we can have number of parameters, we can have p number of primary measurements that means that number of measurements n that is the sample I am talking about number of parameters p in the previous case p was exactly equal to 1. I just calculated the mean of the values p was one single parameter which was derived by using the n values. In this case I am going to use the information given to determine p, p number of parameters. Therefore, degree of freedom is equal to n minus earlier case it was 1 because I got only y was the mean actually in the previous case y was nothing but the mean of the values y could also be something else which is dependent on the x. For example, I may want to determine the square of the x I may want to find out what is the estimate for the square of the x. So, I will be getting a another parameter which will be the square of the parameter. Therefore, each time you are going to use the data to obtain some parameter which characterizes it, I will be losing one degree of freedom and therefore, if there are n parameters as shown here, uh, I am sorry p number of parameters as shown here a 1 to a p, then the number of degrees of freedom lost is p and therefore, you get a degree of freedom n minus p. Therefore, when you use the variance formula you have to divide by n minus p and therefore, the sample theory, sampling theory shows or says that if you evaluate a number of parameters p with a number of n number of data available after repeated measurements you are going to the, the variance is actually bigger than what you would think 
the bigger it will be bigger than what it means that is what you will see. In fact, I am going to take a an example which clearly indicates this and in fact, I am taking an example which was done which was taken in the previous uh, lecture the same example where I measure the resistances the resistance of a certain resistor again and again and the data is exactly the same no difference, but I am going to reinterpret now in terms of what we have learned from sampling theory. So, with the resistance of a certain resistor if you go back to this slide you will see is measured repeatedly obtain the following data number represents the number of experiment number in this case 1, 2, 3 etcetera and in each one of these I have measured the resistance as 1.22 etcetera and I have already discussed this example therefore, we need not go through all of them. So, 1.22, 23, 26, 21, 22, 22, 22 and 24 and 19 these are the individual values of the resistor obtained in the experiment. So, what is the best estimate? Of course, this is best estimate already we know is nothing but the mean of all these values and that does not change from the previous lecture to this lecture, but what is the error with 95 percent confidence that is the one which is going to change. So, best estimate is the mean and uh, it was also obtained in the last example, example 1 contained the same numbers. In fact, I have taken the slide from there in the first lecture, the second lecture. So, the value of R bar is 1.22 kilo ohms and now I have changed the symbols here. I have used the estimator sigma e as you can see here sigma e is the estimator and then sigma e squared is now 1 over n minus 1 n is 9 n is 9 9 minus 1 is 8 1 over 8 of sigma 1 to 9 instead of 1 over 9 I have taken 1 over 8 which is 1 over n minus 1 sigma 1 to 9 r i minus r bar whole squared r bar is nothing but your sample mean in the previous terminology. So, r i minus r bar whole squared this gives you slightly more now 3.75 the earlier uh, slide, slide uh, case it was 3.33 it has increased to 3.75 integral to the power of minus 4 and therefore, I can obtain the this uh, must be this is wrong here it should be sigma e is actually 0 0.02 kilo ohm. So, this is sigma e equal to square root of this number 0 0.02 it is 0 0.019 which I am rounding out to 0 0.02 and the previous case I had, I had also rounded out to 0 0.02, but this was smaller than this. Therefore, the final answer does not change the final answer does not change 1.96 times sigma is roughly equal to 0 0.04 actually is 0.036 in the earlier case it was slightly smaller than this. Therefore, you see that the estimated value of the error is larger when you take into account the results from the sampling theory. So, just to round off what I what we should do is in the future whenever we give an example we will use the results derived from sampling theory that means we are going to divide the variance by the number of degrees of freedom, but not number of samples number of measurements it will be n minus p where n is the number of times we have repeated the measurement p is the number of parameters we have estimated. In fact, when we go to regression analysis will be it will become more clear as to what we mean by the number of parameters, but right now we shall remember that the division is by n minus p, but not n itself that means that the error is actually larger than what you would imagine. So, now let us look at the second thing which we mentioned in the first slide the question of propagation of error. Let me just briefly explain what is happening here a derived quantity q which is shown by the symbol capital Q is estimated based on the measurement of primary quantities a 1 a 2 a m here the number of parameters a number of primary quantities is measured is a 1 a 2 etcetera a m each one of these is repeated again and again that means that a 1 a 2 up to a m these are all measured again and again measured again and again and we have some idea about the statistical variation of these quantities also and what I want to know is to find out how the statistical 
variations in the quantities a 1 to a m are going to affect the statistical variation of the q. So, the primary measured quantities have measurement errors which are already characterized given by the respective variances sigma i squared a 1 has got sigma 1 squared sigma 2 squared corresponds to the error in a 2 sigma m squared will correspond to sigma vari variance in the this particular parameter which I am measuring. Okay. Sigma 1, sigma 2 etcetera are the standard deviation of the measurement of each one of these quantities a 1 to a m. Now, the question is what is the best estimate for capital Q and what is the variance of Q. So, the question is very simple. I have got a 1, a 2 etcetera measured again and again and therefore, I should be having the mean values of a 1, mean value of a 2 and mean value of a m. Okay. That means, that these values of these after doing them in a large number of times or using during the measurement a large number of times, I got a mean value for a 1, mean value for a 2 and so on up to a m. And I also have as given here the variance for each one of the quantities. So, the propagation of error means there is a certain error in the value of a 1, how is going to propagate or make itself felt in the case of q. There is a certain value of certain error in a 2, how is it going to affect the error in q. There is a certain error in a m, how is it going to affect this. So, all the error in each one of these quantities is going to influence, influence or affect the measured value of q and therefore, this is a process of the error migrating or moving or shifting or propagating from here to here, from here to here, here to here is what is called the propagation of error. So, what I will do is I will use the board to work out the details. of the relationship between the error in the measured quantities or the primary quantities and the error in the derived quantities. So, the end product of this exercise would be a formula which will help us calculate the error in the q. Okay. Let us just uh, recapitulate what we have done. So, we have measured a quantity q which actually depends on several primary quantities a 2, a 1, a 2 etcetera, a m. I also have a 1 bar, a 2 bar, these are also known. Let me just write it here. Known also, this is one. What else is known? We also know sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma m squared. How do we know these things? We know 1 and 2. from repeated or replicate data. I want to digress a little bit here and talk about this errors sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared and so on. In actual practice what is going to happen? That is why sometimes it is confusing that I say something mathematically, then uh, we go to the laboratory and uh, I do something else totally different. So, this is a problem for which there is no solution, only a little bit of uh, thinking about it and understanding what is going on would probably help us. In practice, what happens is that I am not even going to repeat the measurement again and again. Sometimes I may take only one reading or maybe two or three readings at the most and then I would like to 
find out what is happening. But in making the measurement, I am making use of some instrument. And we know that the instrument can resolve some basically a certain may, smallest quantity I can measure. It can resolve between two values which are only that close and no closer. So, sometimes what we do is even though it may not be mathematically correct, sometimes what we do is instead of using the errors obtained from replicate data, we may use the, the maximum error due to just the instrument itself. The instrument itself cannot resolve a certain quantity to better than some value and therefore, the resolution of the instrument itself may be used sometime for the est estimation of these errors. So, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared etcetera, sigma m squared may be taken from the behavior of the instrument. This is not strictly correct. It is not like doing the experiment again and again and understanding the statistics. We are replacing the statistical behavior of the error by looking at the errors introduced in the measurement process due to the limitation of the instrument. This may be justified in a physical sense that the measurement process involves the process of taking a reading. You may take the reading yourself using your, your eyesight or you may ask somebody else to take the reading or it may be even gathered by a data acquisition system. The measurement process can be anything. In each one of the case, there is a certain minimum resolution or minimum smallest quantity which we can resolve and we cannot resolve better than that. And therefore, we can say physically that probably that is the kind of error we are going to introduce in the measurement. Therefore, I am going to replace the statistically determined errors sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, etcetera by the errors due to the measurement process which involves a certain instrument and certain process of getting the data and there is an error introduced in that which is considered as accidental. So, it is a, a certain uh, uh, approximation involved in this, certain uh, hand waving is involved, but I think we all try to do that all the time. So, with this background, what is the question I am asking now? I want to find out what is sigma q square. So, to understand this problem, let us indicate how we estimate the best value for q. So, for determining the best value, I am going to say q b, I will say q b is the best value is nothing but q b based on a 1 bar. That means, I am going to use these are all the best values, best values for the A's. There is no need to prove this because we know that a 1, a 2 etcetera, the mean values are the best values for this. So, I am just assuming or guessing or um, claiming that the best value of q is nothing but the value obtained by using the best values for each one of these measurements. So, this will be there is no proof for this, we are just asserting this and this may be any functional relationship. This is a relationship q b related to a 1 etcetera through some mathematical expression. Okay. Now, let us assume this is a very important assumption sigmas are much smaller than the a's. most of the time we can justify this. We assume that the errors in the measured values are not very large. 
compared to the values of the measured quantities themselves. This is a very important assumption. If they are not, then whatever we are going to derive is not going to be applicable, as simple as that. So, with this assumption, I am going to assume that the perturbations, sigmas, are like perturbations and therefore, I can use a Taylor expansion to decide what is going to be the perturbation in the value of q. So, if I take q minus q b, q b is the best value which is obtained by using the values of a's given by a 1 bar, a 2 bar etcetera and now I am going to perturb this value because whenever a 1 is perturbed q will be perturbed from the value of q b. When a 2 is perturbed q, q will be perturbed from the value of q b. Therefore, this can be written as a Taylor expansion. So, this is the Taylor series. Of course, Taylor series is valid for infinitesimal changes and that can be written as sigma i equal to 1 to m partial of q with respect to a in fact i am showing only the first order terms of course plus terms of order delta a j squared. So, these are the perturbations, these are the partial derivatives because you notice that the function q is a function of several variables and therefore, the Taylor expansion will contain derivative with respect to each one of these variables in turn and therefore, you get partial derivatives. If you write this for a single variable, you would not get a summation here and these perturbations are the ones which are given to us. We will see how it is incorporated later on. So, these are partial derivatives and we also refer to them refer to as influence coefficients. The reason why they are referred to as the influence coefficients is if delta a j is some perturbation q minus q b will be perturbed by a product of delta a j multiplied by this coefficient this is the dou q by dou a j. So, the derivative is enhanced are multiplied by the I am sorry the perturbation is multiplied or enhanced by the magnitude of dou q by dou, dou a j. The larger the influence coefficient the larger the magnification and therefore, the larger the influence of a j on q. So, that is why it is called the influence coefficient. Now, what we have here is q minus q b equal to this and what I am interested in finding out the variance of the q and we will just use the definition of the variance which is given by sigma q squared must be equal to sigma q minus q b whole squared divided by the number of times the measurements were done. So, I will say sigma over n for conciseness. and this can be written as sigma I will just keep the sigma outside this is the exponent number. So, I can say i equal to 1 to n q minus q b whole squared I will write that expression we have derived earlier q minus q b equal to sigma over the j's. So, j equal to 1 to m dou q by 
do a j multiplied by delta a j whole square. So, we have two sums one is the number of times the measurements have been done, the other one is over the number of quantities a j which are involved in the process. And the question is how do we evaluate the influence coefficient? Evaluate at a bars dou q by dou a j will be evaluated because that is the point which is known. The derivatives are all evaluated at the best value. So, I am going to replace the derivative also at the best value that means, that dou q by dou a j are going to be evaluated at the set of values a 1 bar, a 2 bar etcetera up to a m bar. Now, this uh, if I square this, this uh, what is shown inside the this I am talking about this quantity. The square will involve two types of terms, it is like a x plus y plus z whole squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 2 x y plus 2 y z etcetera. So, there are two types of terms. One type of term which involves the square of individual terms, the other one involves the products of terms. So, let us look at these two types of terms. So, the, the square term square will involve involves for example, dou q by dou a j whole square this is one. Second one it will involve delta a j delta a k. This is certainly just simply a coefficient, certain number. When I evaluate at the best point, this is some number, some quantity, some value. These are the individual errors, individual errors. Now, I am going to make the following assumption that the error in delta a j is not related to error in delta a k. That means, that a j and a k are independent of each other. For example, in practice I may use a voltmeter to measure the voltage, a k may be a voltage, I may be measuring a length measurement using a vernier caliper to measure delta a j. So, how are they going to be affected by each other? No, well, the error in this and this error, so these errors are these are independent. So, what will happen if I have two, the product of two quantities which are not related to each other is that this will tend to 0 as n tends to a large number. If I measure again and again the product of two quantities which are not related to each other will tend to 0 whereas, this is this is of course, a square quantity this is always positive. Therefore, with this we can see that what we are going to do is to have q minus q b whole squared will be equal to this will be I think I have to show one more sigma here. to n the number of experiments and this will be and therefore, I can put a flower bracket here and this is the square of the error and if I divide this by n I should get the variance. So, yeah, I have to derive by n 
I think I will I will divide it by the n on the right hand side, not on the left hand side, divided by n. So, what is this quantity now? This whole thing dou q by dou a j delta a j whole squared. I can uh, take one of those terms. This will be dou q by dou a j to delta a j square. And actually, this is also a summation. Sigma j equal to 1 to m, 1 to n, divided by n, because this n is coming from there. This is nothing but your sigma a 1 square, or sigma 1 square. So, you see that all I have to do is to and in fact, I can re, re, I can uh, relate it to sigma q squared, and therefore, I can say that sigma q squared is equal to sigma i equal to one to m sigma q squared is equal to i equal to one to m do q by sigma j whole square. This is called the error propagation formula. I think we will have to stop here and we will resume from here in the next lecture. We will take an example which will be given at that time and then move on to the question of regression analysis as a subsequent or a sequel to this uh, detailed look we are having at the question of errors in measurement, how to characterize them. So, we have come quite far from where we started. We now understand the sampling theory, its results are known to us and then we are able to look at the propagation of errors and this legitimately the next part is to look at the relationships. That means, regression analysis which is a description of this whole thing. Thank you.